The debt's not going up at 2% or 3%. The debt's going up 8, 9, 10% or, or more. The US had a $1 trillion baseline budget deficit, a trillion dollars per year deficit for fiscal 2020 pre pandemic. The Congress threw $3 trillion of emergency aid on top of that. And I'm not even criticizing all those programs. I mean, the, the payroll protection plan loans, the extended unemployment benefits, the increased unemployment benefits. Imagine where we'd be if we hadn't done that. But that aside, debt is debt. They piled $3 trillion on top. Now, this is going to take the U.S. debt to GDP ratio up to 135%. It was 106% when Donald Trump was sworn in. It's close to 130% today. Because remember, you got two things going on. It's a de debt to GDP. So debt's your numerator yeah. and GDP is your denominator, right? Well, what happened? Well, the, the denominator shrank. This got smaller and this got bigger. So what happens to the ratio? It blows up. So now it's 135%. If you get the laws of economics right, which is not easy because most economists don't, yeah. but if you get if you get them right, um, it's really a reflection of, of human nature. I mean, what is an economy other than all the people in the economy, starting businesses, buying, selling, traveling, providing goods and services, et cetera. So um, human nature doesn't change, or at least it hasn't changed much in the last 100,000 years. So the fundamental laws of economics don't change either, uh, but circumstances change, facts change, and that's important. Now, to answer your question, Curry, um, you're right. There is um, a school of thought, uh, a growing one, an influential one, that the debt doesn't matter. It's like, well, wait a second. Um, so what? So the debt to GDP ratio went to 135%, which it did. Who cares? What's wrong with it? 180%. We've got issues. We've got problems. Print up the money and monetize the debt and uh, spend it and uh, keep going. What What is the problem? Uh, this, this comes under the banner of something called modern monetary theory, MMT. Uh, it's flawed. It's wrong. But it's it's got its followers. And those followers are now in the White House. Because um, one of the things Joe Biden had to do to get elected was to make peace with the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. They take the view that if the Treasury didn't spend the money, how would anybody make any money? That's ridiculous. But that's what they say. They say, hey, when the Treasury spends money, what do they do? Well, they they um, build aircraft. They have benefit programs. They have government contracts. They do whatever they do. But when the treasury gives you the money, you take the money and you spend it on somebody else, goods and services, go out to dinner, have subcontractors, whatever it might be. That that's the, the real source of money. They also take the treasury and the Fed and they merge them. Now that's not legally the case. The treasury and the Fed are separate institutions. Oh. The treasury is just part of the executive branch. Uh, and the Fed is an independent agency, uh, and the Federal Reserve Banks are actually privately owned. Uh, a lot of people know, some people know that, some people don't, but the, the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned by banks in the districts so of Citibank, Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, so they're completely separate, but, but the theorists ignore that and say, no, uh, the Treasury needs to spend money because that's how the economy grows, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So you spend the money you don't have, you borrow to cover it, you issue bonds to cover the borrowing. And if the market wants to buy the bonds, fine. But if not, the Fed can buy them and put them away on the balance sheet, wait 30 years and collect the money. What's the problem? Who cares about the debt to GDP ratio? It's kind of a statistical abstract, but why should that stand in the way of using money to solve our problems, which are free healthcare, free childcare, free tuition, um, forgiveness of student loans. That's a 1.2 sorry, $1.6 trillion ticket, by the way. And like, look, everyday readers and investors, there's no reason they should know all this stuff. This is this is total inside baseball. You have to be a geek yeah. like me to kind of keep up with it, but, uh, but it's all coming. But what that means uh, is we're going to test the Rogoff Reinhardt thesis. Now, let me just take a minute to explain, why, explain that. Uh, up to a certain debt to GDP ratio, there is a uh, Keynesian multiplier greater than one. So the classic example is the UK was in a depression before the rest of the world. They have been hit pretty hard uh, before the Wall Street crash. People aren't spending, they're saving. It's the liquidity trap. So if you get money, you pay down debt, when you don't have any debt, you put it in the bank. 
whatever you do, you don't spend it. You, you hoard cash or people were buying gold. They were accused of hoarding gold, et cetera. But what they weren't doing was spending. And there was a lack of aggregate demand and the banks were not lending. So, um, so Keynes said, well, if, the, if people, if, if everyday people won't do it, the government must, the government can borrow, the government can spend. And what they discovered was that if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar 50 of GDP. Uh, now, there's a separate debate as to whether that's actually incremental or whether you're just pulling growth forward. But so what? Even if you are pulling growth forward, maybe that's what you need to do when you're in a liquidity trap. Um, but there's a problem. He called it uh, the general theory, you know, general theory of uh, um, employment, interest, and money. Um, but it was actually a special theory. I think he had a little Einstein on me because of the general theory of relativity, but um, it's actually a special theory, which means it's a theory that works in a set of circumstances, a set of conditions. The conditions where it works are you're either in a recession or just coming out of one. You have excess capacity and uh, 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 labor and uh, uh, industrial capacity, and you have very little debt. In those circumstances, you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, get more than a dollar GDP. The problem is that extra, GD, that extra GDP you get for the borrowing spend, it goes down as the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered is that at 90%, you go through the looking glass. Your payoff is now less than a dollar. You borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you only get 90 cents of GDP or 95 cents, et cetera. So now, not only are you not getting your dollar's worth for the borrowed dollar or something more, which you did at lower levels, you're getting less than a dollar. So now what's happening? You're borrowing a dollar, you're spending a dollar, you're not getting a dollar of GDP, but you are getting a dollar of debt, which means your debt to GDP ratio is going up and the 90% is getting worse. And I just mentioned we're, the United States is at 135%. So here are your two competing schools. There's the, the Keynesian multiplier and creating aggregate demand with government debt and the Reinhard Rogoff, more than a thesis, I would say powerful evidence that beyond 90%, it doesn't work. It goes under less than one on the one hand. And my friend Stephanie Kelton and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris and the modern monetary theorists who say, no, it's all good. How could you get growth if you didn't spend money through the government? These theories don't agree at all. Mm. We're going to find out which ones work. I, 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 I'll, I'll, give it, I'll give away the answer, which is that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have it right. Keynes had it right up to a point. Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered that critical threshold that whether you want to call it tipping point or phase transition, or which physicists call it or whatever. The modern monetary theorists think the opposite, and we're going to find out. But what, but what it means if Reinhardt and Rogoff are right, and I'm right, and Keynes was right, the more you borrow, it's actually a headwind to growth. Now you get le just as up to the threshold, you got more and more and more. Oh, sorry, it, 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 at a low level, you got more, but then it went down. But it's like any uh, diminishing marginal return. You know, the, the curve starts very steeply, you get a lot of payoff, then it flattens out, then it goes down, but it's still positive. But at some point, it goes below the zero line and your marginal return is negative. And that's where we are. The debt's not going up at 2% or 3%. The debt's going up 8, 9, 10% or, or more. The US had a $1 trillion baseline budget deficit, a tr well, trillion dollars per year deficit for fiscal 2020 pre-pandemic. The Congress threw $3 trillion of emergency aid on top of that. I'm not even criticizing all those programs. I mean, the, the payroll protection plan loans, the extended unemployment benefits, the increased unemployment benefits. Imagine where we'd be if we hadn't done that. But that aside, debt is debt. They piled $3 trillion on top. Now, this is going to take the U.S. debt to GDP ratio up to 135%. It was 106% when Donald Trump was sworn in. It's close to 130% today. Because remember, you got two things going on. It's a de debt to GDP. So debt's your numerator yeah. and GDP is your denominator, right? Well, what happened? Well, the, the denominator shrank. This got smaller and this got bigger. So what happens to the ratio? It blows up. So now it's 135%. If you get the laws of economics right, which is not easy because most economists don't, yeah. but if you get, if you get them right, 
Um, it's really a reflection of, of human nature. I mean, what is an economy other than all the people in the economy, starting businesses, buying, selling, traveling, providing goods and services, et cetera. So um, human nature doesn't change, or at least it hasn't changed much in the last 100,000 years. So the fundamental laws of economics don't change either, uh, but circumstances change, facts change, and that's important. Now, to answer your question, Curry, um, you're right. There is um, a school of thought, uh, a growing one, an influential one, that the debt doesn't matter. It's like, well, wait a second. Um, so what? So the G debt to GDP ratio went to 135%, which it did. Who cares? What's wrong with it? 180%. We got issues. We got problems. Print up the money and monetize the debt and uh, spend it and uh, keep going. What What is the problem? Yeah. Uh, this This comes under the banner of something called modern monetary theory, MMT. Uh, it's flawed, it's wrong, but it's it's got its followers and those followers are now in the White House because um, one of the things Joe Biden had to do to get elected was to make peace with the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. They take the view that if the Treasury didn't spend the money, how would anybody make any money? That's ridiculous, but that's what they say. They say, hey, when the Treasury spends money, what do they do? Well, they, they um, build aircraft, they have benefit programs. They have government contracts. They do whatever they do. But when the treasury gives you the money, you take the money and you spend it on somebody else, goods and services, go out to dinner, have subcontractors, whatever it might be. That that's the, the real source of money. They also take the treasury and the Fed and they merge them. Now that's not legally the case. The treasury and the Fed are separate institutions. Oh. The treasury is just part of the executive branch. Uh, and the Fed is an independent agency, uh, and the Federal Reserve Banks are actually privately owned. Uh, but a lot of people know, some people know that, some people don't, but the, the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned by banks in the districts so of Citibank, Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, so they're completely separate, but, but the theorists ignore that and say, no, uh, the Treasury needs to spend money because that's how the economy grows, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So you spend the money you don't have, you borrow to cover it, you issue bonds to cover the borrowing. And if the market wants to buy the bonds, fine. But if not, the Fed can buy them and put them away on the balance sheet, wait 30 years and collect the money. What's the problem? Who cares about the debt to GDP ratio? It's kind of a statistical abstract, but why should that stand in the way of using money to solve our problems, which are free healthcare, free childcare, free tuition, um, forgiveness of student loans. That's a 1.2 Oh, sorry, $1.6 trillion ticket, by the way. And like, look, everyday readers and investors, there's no reason they should know all this stuff. This is this is total inside baseball. You have to be a geek yeah. like me to kind of keep up with it, but, uh, but it's all coming. But what that means uh, is we're going to test the Rogoff Reinhardt thesis. Now, let me just take a minute to explain, my, explain that. Uh, up to a certain debt to GDP ratio, there is a uh, Keynesian multiplier greater than one. So the classic example is the UK was in a depression before the rest of the world. They have been hit pretty hard uh, before the Wall Street crash. People aren't spending, they're saving. It's the liquidity trap. So if you get money, you pay down debt, when you don't have any debt, you put it in the bank. Whatever you do, you don't spend it. You, you hoard cash or people were buying gold, they were accused of hoarding gold, et cetera. But what they weren't doing was spending. And there was a lack of aggregate demand and the banks were not lending. So, um, so Keynes said, well, if, the, if people, if, if everyday people won't do it, the government must, the government can borrow, the government can spend. And what they discovered was that if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar 50 of GDP. Uh, now there's a separate debate as to whether that's actually incremental or whether you're just pulling growth forward, but, so what? Even if you are pulling growth forward, maybe that's what you need to do when you're in a liquidity trap. Um, but there's a problem. He called it uh, the general theory, you know, general theory of uh, um, employment, interest, and money. Um, but it was actually a special theory. I think he had a little Einstein on me because of the general theory of relativity. But um, it's actually a special theory, which means it's a theory that works in a set of circumstances, a set of conditions. The conditions where it works are you're either in a recession or just coming out of one. You have excess capacity and uh, 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 labor and uh, uh, industrial capacity, and you have very little debt. 
in those circumstances, you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, get more than a dollar GDP. The problem is that extra GD, that extra GDP you get for the borrowing spend, it goes down as the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered is that at 90%, you go through the looking glass. Your payoff is now less than a dollar. You borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you only get 90 cents of GDP or 95 cents, et cetera. So now, not only are you not getting your dollar's worth for the borrowed dollar or something more, which you did at lower levels, you're getting less than a dollar. So now what's happening? You're borrowing a dollar, you're spending a dollar, you're not getting a dollar of GDP, but you are getting a dollar of debt, which means your debt to GDP ratio is going up and the 90% is getting worse. And I just mentioned we're, the United States is at 135%. So here are your two competing schools. There's the, the Keynesian multiplier and creating aggregate demand with government debt and the Reinhard Rogoff more than a thesis, I would say powerful evidence that beyond 90%, it doesn't work. It goes under less than one on the one hand. And my friend Stephanie Kelton and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris and the modern monetary theorists who say, no, it's all good. How could you get growth if you didn't spend money through the government? These theories don't agree at all. Mm. We're going to find out which ones work. I, 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 I'll, I'll, give it, I'll give away the answer, which is that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have it right. Keynes had it right up to a point, Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered that critical threshold that whether you want to call it tipping point or phase transition, or which physicists call it or whatever. The modern monetary theorists think the opposite, and we're going to find out. But what, but what it means if Reinhardt and Rogoff are right, and I'm right, and Keynes was right, the more you borrow, it's actually a headwind to growth. Now, you get le- just as up to the threshold, you got more and more and more Oh, sorry, it, 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 at a low level, you got more, but then it went down. But it's like any uh, diminishing marginal return. You know, the, the curve starts very steeply, you get a lot of payoff, then it flattens out, then it goes down, but it's still positive. But at some point, it goes below the zero line and your marginal return is negative. And that's where we are. So 90% is the critical threshold. The US is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. So the way it works is raise interest rates, tighten money, reduce the balance sheet, et cetera, get unemployment up. It doesn't sound like a desirable goal, but that's, that's what it takes. And that's what happened in 1982. Get unemployment high enough so people are buying hamburger instead of steak. They're buying, you know, whatever is the least expensive thing on the shelf, day old bread instead of new bread, or they're not buying gasoline because they're not going to work, et cetera. That will bring prices down, but at a very high cost, which we, we just talked about, which is high unemployment and uh, lower productivity. Uh, meanwhile, the US debt it keeps going up. We haven't really talked about the debt. That part of it looks like 1981. But if you throw in a global financial crisis, then it starts to look more like 2008. Yeah, well, that's like a glacier. Uh, glaciers are extremely powerful, but they move extremely slowly. With some exceptions, but they, they kind of like, you know, an inch a year, a couple inches a year, but they, but they move mountains. I mean, they just, they create rivers, they create canyons, they move mountains. They're extremely powerful, but slow. That's a good metaphor for the impact of, of debt. And when I talk about debt, in particular with the United States, but you can apply this to any country, I focus on the the debt to GDP ratio because you can't really talk about debt in isolation without thinking about the capacity to pay the debt. And a simple example, if you have a $50,000 balance on your credit card and you're making $30,000 a year and trying to pay rent in New York, et cetera, good luck. You're probably going to go bankrupt or at least to fall on that card. But if you owe $50,000 on your credit card, but you're making $5 million a year, it's, you, know, you just write a check, it's no big deal. My point is you can't look at a $50,000 debt and decide if it's a problem or not, unless you compare it to the income. And if it's too low, it's a problem. And if the income is high, not a problem. So that's why you use the debt to GDP ratio. The US just hit uh, $31 trillion in, uh, in national debt, that is national debt, almost all of it in the form of U.S. Treasury securities, uh, not all of it, there are other obligations, but mostly U.S. Treasury securities. Well, is that a problem or not? Well, one way to answer the question is compare it to GDP, do the ratio. 
The answer is that ratio is now a, a little over 130%. What was it in 1980 uh, when Ronald Reagan was uh, elected? Um, the answer is 30%. 30% is completely comfortable. That's like the person with the $50,000 debt is making millions. No big deal. Um, 30% is comfortable. 50%, yeah, getting up there. Uh, Angela Merkel and all her years in Germany, and, uh, and there's a lot of research to back this up, says that 60% was the limit. And that's what the Master's Treaty that created the European Union and the European Central Bank, uh, that was their goal. They said, don't go over 60%. If you do, you're expected to take measures, you know, raise taxes or, or you know, reduce debt or reduce spending, do something to get that back down under 60%. If you, uh, you say, what's the critical threshold where, you know, water turns to steam or, you know, water turns to ice or something changes in such a way that it's not the same. It's, it's radically different, but it happens very quickly. The end, the best, the, the best research says the answer is 90%. And this comes out of, you know, Ken Rogoff at uh, Harvard, also Carmen Reinhardt, who's now the uh, chief economist at the World Bank, but they've looked at uh, hundreds of cases over hundreds of years. And I like that because it's not just, you know, kind of cherry picking data, uh, developed economies, developing economies, uh, economies that issue debt in their own currencies, ones that issue debt in other currencies, principally U.S. dollars, et cetera. So, you know, a wide variety of case studies. And they show that not, when you when your debt to G GDP ratio goes over 90 percent, your your multiplier of an additional debt uh, of additional debt goes below one. So just to put that in context, at, at 30%, if I borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, I might get a dollar 30 of growth. You know, assuming you spend it wisely, that's a, that's a big condition, but uh, you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar and get a dollar 30 of growth. Okay, the debt was productive if you, if you put it to good use. Uh, but that that dollar thirty gets smaller and smaller. As you get close to ninety percent, it goes to a dollar twenty, a dollar ten, a dollar five. Past ninety percent, you know, roughly, uh, you borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar, and you only get ninety five cents of growth. You don't get your dollar back in terms of GDP. And then ninety percent and eighty five percent, etc. So ninety percent is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at one hundred thirty one percent, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. Now, you know, Stephanie Kelton, she's the big brain of uh, modern monetary theory. She's a professor at State University of New York. She says it doesn't matter that, uh, you know, she, they always point to Japan. Japan is at uh, 280%, um, way past any, any member of the peer group. Um, China's probably higher. China's a little more opaque because, well, because they are, but also they they don't have as much national debt. If you, if you look at the national debt to GDP, it's modest, but they have an enormous amount of, of provincial debt. And the banks, the banking system is is owned by the government or controlled by the government. So when you throw in when you throw in the bank debt, the state-owned enterprises, the provincial debt, and the and the government. So that's the real national debt. Kelton says, uh, Stephanie Kelton says, uh, it doesn't matter because um, you're borrowing in your own currency. So if you're Argentina and you're borrowing dollars and you print pesos, how are you going to pay the dollars back unless you have, you know, huge trade surpluses, which they don't. So they just default, you know, Argentina is a serial defaulter and everyone expects that. If you um, borrow in dollars and you print dollars, which the United States does, they're like, what's the problem? Just print the dollars and pay the money back. Uh, well, that's true. If you print dollars, there's no reason to default on dollar debt because you actually can print the money and buy the bonds. But it doesn't mean nothing else bad happens. Uh, what about uh, inflation or hyperinflation? Um, what about uh, the foreign exchange rate? Uh, you know, the exchange rate can collapse. And the, these modern monetary theorists um, show very little understanding of the international aspects. They treat the U.S. like a closed economy, which it's not. I mean, if it were a closed economy and we didn't have to worry about trade deficits, trade surpluses, capital flows, exchange rates, you know, foreign credit, you know, China owning $1 trillion of U.S. Treasury securities, which they do. If you didn't have to worry about any of that, I, I think they'd probably still be wrong, but they'd have a better case. But you do. Um, and they, they don't, they're just not very knowledgeable about any of those things. But you can think of exchange rates 
as a conveyor belt. Exchange rates are one way the problems go from one country to another, or good things can go from one country to another, uh, depending on whether your exchange rate is going up or down, the impact on terms of trade, et cetera. But they, they completely ignore all that. They also ignore the role of commercial banks. They, they just look at the Treasury and the Fed and look at money supply, but like kind of M0, but don't understand how commercial banks create M1 and they do their own thing. They're not uh, they're not on as short a leash as, as they seem to think. But but it, you know, if you read Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, she says, well, we don't really need a bond market, U.S. bond market. Uh, we only have a bond market as a favor to investors because it gives them a place to put their money. Uh, but why, you know, why have, um, you know, he said, you have government spending, so the Treasury borrows money by issuing bonds, and then the Fed monetizes the bonds by buying the bonds, and that gives the Treasury the money to pay the bills, et cetera. She says, do away with all that. Just give the Fed, you know, wire instructions for Lockheed. And if you need five F-35 fighter jets, order them and just send the money right to Lockheed. Why do you need a bond market? I mean, she actually says that. So, okay, you kind of... I mean, legally, that might be possible, but to suggest that you can do that without consequences is nonsense. And they say, what about inflation? Uh, well, she, their view is as long as there's excess capacity and unmet needs, et cetera, you know, you're not going to have inflation because there's a lot of slack in the economy. Well, that's a legitimate debate. But what they say when inflation happens, raise taxes. Um, and the, by the way, they also say you don't need a tax system because if you can just print the money, why do you have to collect taxes? And their answer is, we collect taxes to redistribute income. Okay, well, at least they're honest. I mean, that's kind of a socialist model, but they're honest about it. Uh, but, but it's important to bear in mind that Stephanie was the principal economic advisor to Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. And Bernie Sanders today is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, controls the purse strings. So um, coming out of Congress and Biden's kind of a cipher, he's, you know, he's barely aware of his own existence. So uh, Sanders is in a powerful position and she's she's the, the Bernie whisperer, so to speak, who's behind all this. So uh, if you ask the typical member of Congress, can you define modern monetary theory? They'll look at you funny. They've either never heard of it or they certainly don't know what it means. MMT, you know. But they're acting as they're acting in accordance with modern monetary theory. Whether they know it or not doesn't matter. The actual behavior of the Congress, and again, just go back to COVID 2020, because we talked about the debt to GDP ratio. So in um, around May or June um, 2020, Trump put through a um, a one, sorry, a two trillion dollar COVID relief package. And that was when, you know, the, the, pay, the paycheck protection plan, that uh, was 800 billion and everyone got the, the $1,200 check, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end of December, at the very end of the Trump administration, they did another trillion dollars uh, almost. Uh, and that's when everyone got the $600 checks. And now you're up, up to $1,800. Uh, by the way, those checks, that is helicopter money. Um, that's, you know, what the Fed does is, is kind of nonsense, but when it's fiscal policy, not monetary policy, and you're handing out checks, that is helicopter money and credit to Larry Summers for saying, you're going to get inflation out of this. Well, Biden comes into office in January, 2021, and he's like, not to be outdone. He did his own COVID relief package. That was another $2 trillion. And that's when we all got the $1,400 checks. They just handed them out. And then later that year, uh, or they did the um, trillion dollar infrastructure package. And then just to top it off, we, what we get recently was the, uh, the uh, just under a trillion dollar Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam. Well, and the baseline budget deficit, before everything I just described, the baseline budget deficit was about a trillion dollars a year. So take a trillion dollars for 2020, 2021, and, and 2022, Add on, you know, two trillion for Trump's first package, one trillion for a second one, uh, two trillion for Biden's first package, one trillion for the Green New Scam, and I think a trillion for infrastructure. That's seven trillion dollars on top of the two trillion dollar baseline budget deficit. So that's nine trillion dollars piled on top of what was at the time. Um, about a, a $21 trillion national debt. So that's how we got to $30 trillion. That's how the ratio went from 106 to 131. These numbers are mind-boggling. And MMT says, 
doesn't matter. But it does matter, and it, it shows up the way I described earlier, which is it it slows growth. You don't get growth. So best case for the U.S. is very slow, weak growth, which we saw from 2009 to 2019. Worst case is you throw a recession on top of that, which we're heading for, uh, and the U.S. will be in fiscal distress. The People ask me, are we going to have a recession? And my answer is we might be in a recession right now and not even know it. Uh, we could be facing a global recession, including China, but just focusing on the U.S. because uh, because that's the Fed's sort of territory. So Powell saying, yeah, the economy's great is, is nonsense. What he said, he said, you know, by the end of the year, we could be looking at 4.2% unemployment, 35 to 4% interest rates, and, you know, kind of 2.7% inflation. And you're like, wait a second, inflation is 86 today. How do you get to, you know, 27 Number one, and then what about rising unemployment and um, uh, and, and the higher interest rates? How do you reconcile those things? He said all three of those things, but what state of the world could make those things come true? There's only one, which is a recession. A recession would do it. A recession will raise unemployment, higher interest rates will cause the recession, and the recession will cause inflation to go down. So in effect, Powell is saying we're going to have a recession. Inflation, yeah, prices go up, so we understand that. Or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money, same thing. But inflation, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called, not to get too technical, but it's called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. If there, and we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. U.S. really started, but U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Um, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply, causing the price of oil to go up, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. And you're exactly right. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors. So they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The other source of inflation is called um, demand pull. And this is when individuals, you, me, and all of our viewers and, you know, everyday Canadians and Americans worry about inflation. We say, well, you know, I'm thinking about buying a refrigerator. Better buy it now before the price goes up with a car, or house, or whatever it, it might be. They're different, but they affect each other. When, when, the, when the cost push inflation from the supply side has enough effect, there's a tipping point or critical threshold in, in psychology. We say, you know... Maybe it is out of control. I better go buy some stuff. Then the velocity of money goes up and then you get inflation. So the Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. And you're right about that. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral. And that is really hard to, to change. So what they're trying to do, they know they can't change the supply side, but they're trying to squash the demand side before it gets out of control. Now, the question, of course, is can they do it? The answer is they can do it, but at what cost? So a general rule of thumb, this is really simple. You have to get, uh, forget about nominal interest rates. Nominal interest rates are the rates you see on your screen, you hear about the headlines and all that. Real interest rates are nominal interest rates minus inflation. Take the inflation out and see what's left. Well, right now, real interest rates are about 2%, actually one and one and three quarters under the Fed's policy rate. Inflation's 8.6%. So, you know, just round numbers, one and a half minus uh, eight and a half, uh, that's, uh, that makes the inflation rate negative seven. It's nowhere near. It's got to be positive two. Real rates have to be plus two to, to squash inflation. Right now, they're negative seven. So that implies that the Fed has to raise interest rates to 10.5% to get to positive to real interest rates. That's never going to happen. They're never going to get there. They will destroy the economy long before they get there. So the Fed has no hope of squashing inflation from the demand side, as you described, by raising rates, unless inflation comes down for other reasons. So what they're going to do, they're going to keep raising rates, you know, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, hope that inflation comes down from eight to maybe three, although I think that's a stretch. You could get into positive real rate territory, but they're really far away from it. So I think, by the way, I, I described what they're trying to do. I should make it clear they're going to fail. They, they, the, only way, the only way inflation comes down the way we're talking about is if they trash the economy, a severe recession. If that happens, yeah, you say, well, do people still need to put gas in their cars? 
Well, you're right, but not if they're unemployed because they're not going to work. There's a lot here that's just for show. It sounds good on TV, but um, the, there's a lot less here than BCI. But the point is, this is not over anytime soon. And even if it were, when you break supply chains, you can't just put them back together. It's like breaking a vase in a thousand pieces and you gotta go buy a new vase. It's gonna take years to undo this damage. So I spoke to the individual who was probably the single individual most responsible for building the modern supply chain. It was 30 years from 1989 to 2019. Uh, it was headed one of the largest companies in the world. And this is what they did among other things. Uh, and he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. It took us three years to blow it up. It's not gonna come back in a year. This is gonna take five, 10, 15 years to build a new one. So, so what, it's what I call supply chain 2.0. Well, buying a refrigerator is a good idea. Buying a freezer might be a better idea. We're looking for food shortages by the fall. Now, when I say food shortages in Africa and Middle East, this will mean mass starvation. You may see the greatest humanitarian crisis in history because they literally can't get the food. Everyone's like, well, gee, you can't get Ukrainian weight at wheat. What's the big deal? Buy it from somewhere else. There is no, there is nowhere else. Canada and the United States grow an enormous amount of wheat, but we use most of it internally and uh, we feed because it's not for humans by the way we feed our animals so say you feed cows pigs this is how you get beef and pork this is an example of the supply chain how it filters all the way through so you would expect higher prices to persist you would expect food shortages uh, buying a freezer is not a bad idea um, and uh, the future supply chain is going to be the it goes by different names uh, Jenny Yon calls it friend shoring uh, Macron calls it uh, constellation uh, I call it the College of Nations, but basically we'll have supply chains and trade, but it'll be sort of members only. So U.S., Canada, Australia, Europe, others, Japan, uh, will be invited to join, but not China. You know, Russia is going to be in the waiting room for a while. We, sh we should be better allies of Russia, but the, the, the Democrats in the United States have pretty much made that impossible, at least for the short run. Uh, and then there'll be other countries that are kind of neutral in, in that scheme, you know, Brazil, India, and others. But the point is you'll still have trade and you'll have supply chains, but it'll be kind of friendly countries, members only, uh, and exclude China. So that decoupling is going to go ahead. The Chinese seem to be not only fine with it, but they're actually leading the way. Uh, you know, semiconductor manufacturing is moving back to the United States. Um, you know, the 20 billion of uh, new semiconductor plants of Intel. Why is Taiwan Semiconductor spending over $5 billion to build new semiconductor fabrication plants in the United States? Well, obviously, because they're worried about China. We're reshuffling the deck, but it, none of this stuff is easy. I mean, uh, semiconductor plants take five years to build a new refinery. Forget it. That's like seven to 10 years. We haven't had one in the United States since 1977. So it's going to take a while to do all this. Well, we can do it. So if I said we're definitely going to have inflation, you would know what to do. You'd buy gold, hard assets, land, silver, treasury notes, government bonds, et cetera. If I said we're definitely going to have deflation, you would also know what to do. You would uh, reduce leverage. You would uh, have more cash. Uh, and there are, other, there are other assets you could go into. The problem is we could have both. There's no question we have inflation right now. It's, it's, it's front and center. But if the Fed squashes it and causes a recession or worse, you could flip to deflation very quickly. So this is going to sound like a, 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 an obvious statement. What you want is diversification. Sounds obvious, but most people don't know what diversification is. I see people, I've got 50 stocks in 10 different sectors. I'm highly diversified. I'm like, no, you're not. You have one asset class called stocks. Real diversification, have a slice, a slice of stocks, gold, real estate, cash, um, agriculture is a good investment. Energy, forget you know, the green new scam. That's a joke. Uh, oil and natural gas are going to be around for a long time. The people ask me, are we going to have a recession? And my answer is, we might be in a recession right now and not even know it. Uh, we could be facing a global recession, including China, but just focusing on the U.S. because uh, because that's the Fed's sort of territory. So Powell saying, you know, the economy is great is nonsense. What he said, he said, you know, by the end of the year, we could be looking at 4.2% unemployment, 35 to 4% interest rates, and, you know, kind of 2.7% inflation. And you're like, wait a second, inflation is 86 today. How do you get to, you know, 2.7, number one, and then what about rising unemployment and, um, uh, and, and uh, higher interest rates. How do you reconcile those things? He said all three of those things. 
But what state of the world could make those things come true? There's only one, which is a recession. A recession would do it. A recession will raise unemployment, higher interest rates will cause the recession, and the recession will cause inflation to go down. So in effect, Powell is saying we're going to have a recession. Inflation, yeah, prices go up, so we understand that, or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money, same thing. But inflation, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called, not to get too technical, but it's called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. If there, and we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. The U.S. really started it, but U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Um, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply, causing the price of oil to go up, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. And you're exactly right. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors. So they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The other source of inflation is called um, demand pull. And this is why in individuals, you, me, and all of our viewers and you know everyday Canadians and Americans, worry about inflation. We say, well, you know, I'm thinking about buying a refrigerator. Better buy it now before the price goes up or the car or house or whatever it, it might be. They're different, but they affect each other. When, when, the, when the cost push inflation from the supply side has enough effect, there's a tipping point or critical threshold in, in psychology. We say, you know, maybe it is out of control. I better go buy some stuff. Then the velocity of money goes up and then you get inflation. So the Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. And you're right about that. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral. And that is really hard to, to change. So what they're trying to do, they know they can't change the supply side, but they're trying to squash the demand side before it gets out of control. Now, the question, of course, is can they do it? The answer is they can do it, but at what cost? So a general rule of thumb this is really simple. You have to get... Uh, forget about nominal interest rates. Nominal interest rates are the rates you see on your screen, you hear about the headlines and all that. Real interest rates are nominal interest rates minus inflation. Take the inflation out and see what's left. Well, right now, real interest rates are about 2%, actually one, one and three quarters under the Fed's policy rate. Inflation is 8.6%. So, you know, just round numbers, one and a half minus uh, eight and a half, uh, that's, uh, that makes the inflation rate negative seven. It's nowhere near. It's got to be positive two. Real rates have to be plus two to, to squash inflation. Right now, they're negative seven. So that implies that the Fed has to raise interest rates to 10.5% to get to positive two real interest rates. That's never going to happen. They're never going to get there. They will destroy the economy long before they get there. So the Fed has no hope of squashing inflation from the demand side, as you described, by raising rates, unless inflation comes down for other reasons. So what they're going to do, they're going to keep raising rates, you know, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, hope that inflation comes down from eight to maybe three, although I think that's a stretch. You could get into positive real rate territory, but they're really far away from it. So I think, by the way, I described what they're trying to do. I should make it clear they're going to fail. They, they, the, only way, the only way inflation comes down the way we're talking about is if they trash the economy, a severe recession. If that happens, yeah, you say, well, do you, people still need to put gas in their cars. Well, you're right, but not if they're unemployed because they're not going to work. There's a lot here that's just for show. It sounds good on TV, but um, the, there's a lot less here than we see. But the point is, this is not over anytime soon. And even if it were, when you break supply chains, you can't just put them back together. It's like breaking a vase in a thousand pieces, and you've got to go buy a new vase. It's going to take years to undo this damage. So I spoke to the individual who was probably the single individual most responsible for building the modern supply chain. It was 30 years from 1989 to 2019. Uh, it was headed one of the largest companies in the world, and this is what they did, among other things. Uh, and he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. It took us three years to blow it up. It's not going to come back in a year. This is going to take 5, 10, 15 years to build a new one. So, so what, it's what I call supply chain 2.0. Well, buying a refrigerator is a good idea. Buying a freezer might be a better idea. We're looking for food shortages by the fall. Now, when I say food shortages in Africa and Middle East, this will mean mass 
starvation. You may see the greatest humanitarian crisis in history because they literally can't get the food. Everyone's like, well, gee, you can't get Ukrainian weight, uh, wheat. What's the big deal? Buy it from somewhere else. There is no, there is nowhere else. Canada and the United States grow an enormous amount of wheat, but we use most of it internally. And uh, we feed, because it's not for humans, by the way, we feed our animals. So say you feed cows, pigs. This is how you get beef and pork. This is an example of the supply chain, how it filters all the way through. So you would expect higher prices to persist. You would expect food shortages. Uh, buying a freezer is not a bad idea. Um, and um, the future supply chain is going to be, the, it goes by different names. Uh, Janet Yellen calls it friendshoring. Uh, Macron calls it uh, constellation. Uh, I call it the College of Nations. But basically, we'll have supply chains and trade, but it'll be sort of members only. So US, Canada, Australia, Europe, others, Japan, uh, will be invited to join, but not China, you know, Russia is going to be in the waiting room for a while. We, sh we should be better allies of Russia, but the, the, the Democrats in the United States have pretty much made that impossible, at least for the short run. Uh, and then there'll be other countries that are kind of neutral in, in that scheme, you know, Brazil, India, and others. But the point is you'll still have trade and you'll have supply chains, but it'll be kind of friendly countries, members only, uh, and exclude China. So that decoupling is going to go ahead. The Chinese seem to be not only fine with it, but they're actually leading the way. Uh, you know, semiconductor manufacturing is moving back to the United States. Um, you know, the 20 billion of uh, new semiconductor plants from Intel. And why is Taiwan Semiconductor spending over $5 billion to build new semiconductor fabrication plants in the United States? Well, obviously, because they're worried about China. We're reshuffling the deck, but it, none of this stuff is easy. I mean, uh, Semiconductor plants take five years to build a new refinery. Forget it. That's like seven to 10 years. We haven't had one in the United States since 1977. So it's going to take a while to do all this. Well, we can do it. So if I said we're definitely going to have inflation, you would know what to do. You'd buy gold, hard assets, land, silver, treasury notes, government bonds, et cetera. If I said we're definitely going to have deflation, you would also know what to do. You would uh, reduce leverage. You would uh, have more cash. Uh, and there are, other, there are other assets you could go into. The problem is we could have both. There's no question we have inflation right now. It's, it's, it's front and center. But if the Fed squashes it and causes a recession or worse, you could flip to deflation very quickly. So this is going to sound like a, a, an obvious statement. What you want is diversification. Sounds obvious, but most people don't know what diversification is. I see people, I've got 50 stocks in 10 different sectors. I'm highly diversified. I'm like, no, you're not. You have one asset class called stocks. Real diversification, have a slight slice of stocks, gold, real estate, cash, um, agriculture is a good investment, energy, forget you know, the green new scam. That's a joke. Uh, oil and natural gas are going to be around for a long time. China doesn't have any of that. None of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't trust the Chinese as far as you can throw them. I was a facilitator and then a participant in the first ever financial war game ever conducted by the Pentagon. We did this at a, place, a top secret uh, location called the Warfare Analysis Laboratory. One of the things we did there, I was on the China team. I wanted to make it realistic. So I said, let's lie, cheat and steal because that's what Wall Street does. And that's that's a more realistic game. So I recruited a friend of mine who's fluent in Russian to be on the Russian team. And I had dinner with him before we went down to uh, to the laboratory. And I said, look, here's the plan. I'm, I'm going to persuade my China team colleagues to um, basically announce a, a new gold standard. And uh, we, we've accumulated enough gold and we're going to say for now and our currency is backed by gold. We're going to put the gold in Switzerland to keep everybody happy. We're going to issue notes from a, a bank created in London under, under English laws to keep everybody happy. Here's the thing. We're going to say from now on, if you want our exports, you have to pay for us in this new currency. We're not taking dollars anymore. And furthermore, and if you want some of this new currency, you can do you can deposit your gold in Switzerland and the bank will issue you some currency so you're in the system. Or you can trade with us and run a surplus and then we'll pay you in the currency and you can use that to buy our stuff or we'll give you loans. But one way or another, we're done with the dollar. And obviously this is very forward leaning, but the whole idea of a war game is to help the Pentagon think five or 10 years ahead. So the first thing that happened when these, you go to your embassy, your conclave, you, you come out and you stand up at the podium, you announce your plans, and then everybody reacts and it's discussed, et cetera. 
the first thing that happened is there was a group. So we had the you had the red team, the yellow team, the blue team, as the case may be, and they're all different countries or areas. But there's a white team, which are the referees. They decide what you did. And the first thing they did when we announced the goal move, they ruled it as an illegal move. They said, no, no, that's not in any of our scenarios. You can't do that. And I stood up, about 100 people in the room, you know, three-star generals, CIA, FBI. You know, I said, wait a minute. I said, this is a war. There are no illegal moves in a war. The whole idea is to be out of the box or live in a world where there are no boxes. That's what we're doing here. So they agreed. They said, okay, we, we think it's a really dumb idea, but we'll let you do it. Well, over the course of two days, it accelerated and gathered momentum. At the end of it, Russia got PowerPoints. Okay, so this was 2009. Within 10 years, so, so what were the, what facts happened? Within 10 years, Russia tripled its gold reserves. Uh, last week, the dollar value of Russia's gold exceeded the dollar value of its treasury securities. They have 20% of their reserves in gold and their, the value of their gold is more than the value of the US treasury securities. They're dumping treasuries buying gold. Exactly what we warned the Pentagon about 10 years ago. Um, and here it is in China has more than tripled its reserves. So we're not there yet, but we're moving to some kind of gold back world. But the point is that was all in the war game. That's all in the book. And I made one other point. I said. Currency wars don't happen all the time. They might only happen twice in a century. But when they happen, they can last for 10 or 15 years. That's how long it takes to sort out. What do you describe about the Chinese money supply is absolutely correct. People in the United States complain, oh, the Federal Reserve has printed $4 trillion in the past year. And they have. They have printed $4 trillion in the last year. They're taking the Fed balance sheet from about... 3.5 trillion to 7.5 trillion. So yeah, we printed $4 trillion in the past year. Didn't do any good, won't do any good, but we did it. Uh, but Chinese money supply is even larger and growing faster. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds on China's internal monetary policy. I could, except to say that they're grossly over leveraged. The economy is investment driven, not consumption driven. They're about 40%, 45% investment. The US is about 25% investment. So that gives you some idea of how much, how investment is to the Chinese, which is actually okay if you're investing in productive assets that pay the way. They're not. They're wasting the money. I've, I've been to China many times, been going back and forth there for uh, 35 years. Um, I've been out in the countryside. I don't just stick to the hotel lobby in Beijing. I got mud on my boots visiting these ghost cities. And um, so each ghost city, there are a bunch of them, actually seven up, seven, imagine building seven cities. That's what I saw. And so they got one or two skyscrapers and they got mixed use and they got retail shopping, a country club, a hotel, a golf course, a pond, highway stops, airport, et cetera. And it's all empty. I mean, it's just all empty, shiny new construction. Some of it's still under construction, um, all empty. So I said to the communists, I said, what are you guys doing here? I mean, no, nobody's here. So, oh, don't worry, don't worry. People will be coming from the countryside. And they would be populating these cities. And uh, I said, when? I said, no one's coming. And uh, besides that, you've already drained the countryside. That already happened. But I said, you cannot mothball a building. It's not like some old clothes. I mean, you the way a building maintains itself, it gets occupied and is maintenance and people fix it and all that. I, I, I visited, I used to travel a lot in Central Africa in the early 80s, um, Zaire at the time, today it's the Congo, I was in Kinshasa, but it was right after the 70s commodities boom. And they took the money, of course they wasted it and they built these skyscrapers in Kinshasa, which is like a swampy, scary, funky, you know, city. But there's a skyscraper, but the windows are falling out and there were rust stains running down this, the side and the elevators were broken. So it might've looked nice the day they built it, but it was never really used. And now it was literally, when I was there, it wasn't that much later after they built it, it was falling apart. So that's gonna happen in China. My point being, if you uh, apply, you know, generally accepted accounting principles to their investment account, you would write it off the day they open the building because nobody's there. It's not worth anything. So they're wasting the money. They're over leveraged. They're over printed. However, none of that has anything to do with the status of the Chinese yuan as a global reserve currency. The, the yuan is not a reserve currency. It will not be probably in my lifetime, maybe never. And I'll tell you why, because uh, a lot of people don't understand what a reserve currency really is. You know, you get a report from the IMF 
and it says, you know, 60% of global reserves are in dollars, which is true, and about 25% are in euros, which is true. So 85% of global reserves are in dollars or euro, which means the only meaningful exchange rate in the world is the euro US dollar cross rate. Everything else is working around the edges. You got some sterling and yen and Swiss francs and a couple other things. Aussie dollar is tiny, believe it or not, good currency, but not a, not a big part of it. And China's like this kind of invisible 1% slice down at the bottom. And, and China has $1.4 trillion in its reserves. But here's the point. It's not as if they have pallets of $100, $100 bills stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They don't. You invest in securities. In other words, they're dollar-denominated securities. So it's not actually dollars. They're treasury bills, notes, and bonds denominated in dollars. So the thing that makes a reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. You need something to invest in. Uh, again, so you need a, a liquid bond market with different maturities, different interest rates. You need dealers. You need auctions. You need payment and clearance systems. You need repo or repurchase agreements, futures, options, when issue trading, uh, you know, custodians, the rule of law. There's a whole massive infrastructure which we started working on uh, when Alexander Hamilton was, uh, you know, advising George Washington, and we've been doing it ever since. And others, Bank of England has done the same. China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't trust the Chinese as far as you can throw them. Um, and so they have no chance of being a global reserve currency, none. Same with the Russian ruble, same with a lot of other currencies, same with Bitcoin. There's no, show me the Bitcoin bond market. Maybe you can get my attention, but not sooner. So none of those are going to replace the dollar. I, first thing, I, I, my wife hates me to admit this, but I was once a registered lobbyist in Washington. I ran an office there. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. And the first thing I learned in Washington is you can't beat something with nothing. You know, if you hate a policy or a program, you just hate it. You write op-eds. You pro fine. You're not going to change it unless you bring something to replace it. So for all the criticisms of the dollar, and there are plenty of them, you're not going to dethrone the dollar as the leading global reserve currency unless you can show me what you're going to replace it with. And there's one and only one contender in the world today, which is gold. So that's a whole other conversation. I'm not saying we're going to be on a gold standard tomorrow. Uh, as far as China's concerned, yeah, yeah, China's a house of cards. It's going to collapse. It's going to be ugly. Hard to say when, but probably sooner than later. And they, and they know it. And they're not going to be a global reserve currency. So we can put China to one side, but yeah, China's a house of cards. Now, getting it back to the United States, the first point, let's talk about stimulus first. So yeah, the Fed printed three, sorry, the Fed printed four trillion dollars. Congress, we had trillion dollar, what are called baseline budget deficits going into the pandemic. So with no pandemic, we were going to have a trillion dollar deficit in 2020 and 2021. Now Congress put three trillion on top of that with rescue and bailout programs last uh, March, April, and May. That was the CARES program, payroll protection plan, um, aid to hospitals, uh, uh, extended unemployment benefits, higher unemployment benefits, et cetera. And I'm not saying any of those things were bad. It was needed uh, to keep things from getting a lot worse. But we put $3 trillion on top of this. So there's $4 trillion for fiscal 2020. They just did a trillion last week uh, in the kind of final days of the Trump administration. So that's five trillion. And Biden has announced his plan. He's going to have a two trillion dollar rescue bailout so-called stimulus plan now. So that's seven trillion dollars plus the trillion dollar baseline for fiscal 2021. So there's eight trillion dollars in deficit spending in two fiscal years, four trillion dollars of money printing by the Fed. Now, those are the numbers. That's not. That's not projections. That that's baked in the pie. Just don't call it stimulus. It will have no stimulative effect. Does it again? As I say, keep the lights on. Yes. Did would it, would just some people keep their jobs last spring because their employer got payroll protection plans? Yes. Did other people benefit from increased unemployment benefits? Yes. Was a lot of that necessary because things were in such bad shape? Yes. So I'm not arguing that side of it, but it does not stimulate. It's not going to get us out of the depression. Let me be very specific as to why, because I don't like to, I don't make claims without backing it up. On the money supply, you can print all the money you want, but Milton Friedman was wrong, the monetarists are wrong, the Austrian school is wrong. Money printing does not cause inflation. What causes inflation is something called velocity, which is the turnover of money. The money has to be lent and spent. Banks have to be lenders. 
People and businesses have to be borrowers. You have to be spending it, get it in circulation, in other words, in order to potentially to have some inflation. Uh, and that's the technical name for that is velocity. Velocity is dropping, sinking like a stone. And by the way, it's been dropping since 1998. It dropped faster in the 2008 crisis. It's dropping faster today. But the trend has been very steeply down for the last 22 years. Um, and so the you know, nominal GDP, so the, the, the dollar value of all goods and services, leaving aside inflation, that's, that's what we mean by nominal value. Nominal value of gross domestic product is money supply times velocity. How much money is there and how much does it turn over? Multiply one by the other and that's your nominal GDP. And I remind people that $7 trillion times zero is zero. Meaning you can print the seven trillion dollars, but if you don't have any velocity, you don't have an economy. And so you can understand monetary policy is a desperate race between increasing money supply and declining velocity. One offsets the other so that you barely keep nominal GDP where it is. In fact, it's going to go down about six or seven percent. We're not getting back to 2000. 19 levels of output. If you take 2019 as your baseline, we're not getting back to 2019 levels till 2023 at the earliest. We're not getting back to 2019 levels of job creation, the number of people who have jobs until 2025 at the earliest. That's why I call it a depression, not a recession. Now flip over to fiscal policies like, hey, they're sending everybody $2,000 checks. And they are, the people are going to get those checks. And so the, the Wall Street, which you know usually gets things wrong, that's the first thing you got to know about Wall Street, because they don't really care about you. They care about rap fees and how they make money. So they're saying, all right, they're going to send out the $2,000 checks and people are going to get those checks and they're going to run right out. And they're going to buy a car, a refrigerator, you know, paint the kitchen, whatever it may be. No, the first two things are true. They're going to spend the money and they're going to, sorry, they're going to borrow the money and they're going to send people the checks. But when people get the checks, they're not spending it. What they're doing, they're saving it. They're, they're either paying down debt, which is equivalent to savings, or they're putting the money in the bank, which is savings. So certainly if you lost your job, you're not going to take your friends out to dinner. You're going to throw the money in the bank or pay the rent. Uh, but even if you didn't lose your job, you look around like maybe your spouse lost his job. Maybe um, your neighbor lost his job. Maybe you think you're next, like you have a job, but you're worried you're going to get fired next week. So you save it. And, and the, the name for that, economists call that precautionary savings or, you know, plain English, it's, it's for saving for a rainy day, except it's raining everywhere. So, so they are going to, they are going to, send the checks out, but people aren't going to spend it. And that's the reason you're not going to get the stimulative effect, but you are going to increase the deficit, which gets back to this debt to GDP ratio. So take the total debt divided by GDP. And that's, that's some ratio. The research is very convincing, very clear. A number of studies show this, that up to about 90%, so 90% debt to GDP, you get a little bit of something called a, a, Keynesian, a Keynesian multiplier, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get a dollar ten of GDP, or you get a dollar five of GDP. And it works maybe temporarily, but it works when people won't spend the money the government can. That's the idea. But when the debt to GDP GDP ratio goes above 90%. That's what physicists call a critical threshold or a phase transition. Now you're through the looking glass. Now the Keynesian multiplier drops below one, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, but you only get 90 cents of GDP. But meanwhile, the debt went up a dollar. So what's happening to the debt to GDP ratio? This is going up dollar for dollar, but this is going up 90 cents on the dollar. So the ratio is getting worse. Guess what the US GDP, debt to GDP ratio is today? The answer is it's about 135%. So we're way past that 90% threshold. And by the way, who's in that club? I can tell you, Lebanon, Greece, and Italy. So there's your lunch table for four, you know, the four super debtors league. And it just gets worse. And that, G that ratio past 90% is a headwind to growth because people look at it and like, hey, I don't have a PhD in economics, but I just don't like what I see. And people understand correctly, and this is the behavioral adaptation that policymakers on Wall Street do not understand. But the, the, the behavioral ad adaptations, people look at and say, you know, I don't know how this is going to end, but it's going to end. I'm either going to, we're either going to have a default or we're going to have something like hyperinflation to make the debt go away, or they're going to raise my taxes. Not sure which, maybe all of the above, but I, I have to save more money to meet my lifetime goals in the face of some bad outcome that's going to come out of this. That's the real world behavior. And economists know very little about the real world. So, um, so the point is, Increasing the money supply doesn't work because velocity is declining. 
increasing deficits doesn't work because people are saving, not spending, and they're preparing for worse outcomes. So neither one of these, you can call it money printing or spending, but don't call it stimulus because it doesn't stimulate. We're not getting out of this. And that's why I call my book, The New Great Depression. So the question is, will the Fed go down that path, do what they have to do, do the only thing they can do to subdue inflation at the cost of a very severe recession and something like a stock market crash? Or uh, a couple of things. Number one, I would I would increase my allocation to cash. Um, I'll stick with cash, but let me kind of put that in a context. The most powerful investment tool we have is diversification problem is people don't understand what diversification means. So I run into people all the time. They say, well, I'm completely diversified. I own 50 different stocks in 10 different sectors, you know, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, minerals, you know, et cetera. And I say, you're not diversified. You may own 50 stocks in 10 sectors, but you have one asset class, stocks, which are subject to conditional correlation. They, in calm markets, yeah, they, they're idiosyncratic, but in panics, they all go down together or in bubbles, they all go up together. So they're, so you're not diversified. So what is diversification? Diversification is having slices of asset classes that are minimally correlated. It's not probably not zero, but as close to zero as you can get. So what would that be? You'd have a slice of gold, but I recommend 10%. And people, I have some strong views on gold and I've written a lot about it, but people are surprised to hear me say 10%. percent like, oh, Jim, why isn't it 50% or 100% if you believe all this? Well, I do believe it. I wouldn't say it if I didn't, but you don't want to be 100% in anything. You don't want to be 50% in anything. 10% is fine. If I'm wrong, you won't get hurt. And if I'm right, you're going to make so much money that it'll actually kind of be the insurance on the rest of your portfolio. But that leaves 90%. So I would have a large slug in cash, maybe 30%. And people say, well, wait a second, banks pay me 25 basis points, you know, stock market's going up. Why would I want to be in cash? It's horrible. A couple of things. Number one, the stock market might not always go up. Cash is the opposite of leverage. So leverage increases the volatility of the rest of the portfolio. You'll get much bigger returns, but mm -hmm. you'll have much bigger losses. If you have a slice of cash and you say you've got uh, a volatile asset over here, which are stocks and other volatile assets over here, gold's fairly volatile. If you got that volatility and you have cash, it will reduce the overall volatility so you can sleep better at night. Cash is a great asset in deflation. And if you're talking about inflation, which is here, then you got you got to deal with that. But uh, don't rule out deflation. If we go into a recession because the Fed over tightens or, you know, the thing about the, the inflation, just a quick aside, there, it comes in two flavors. There's cost push and demand pull. Demand pull is when individuals are, are worried about inflation and they start accelerating purchases. Like, hey, I better go buy that washing machine right now because the price is going up or better go buy that house right now because the price is going up. That's demand pull. Cost push, uh, uh, cost push. Uh, push comes from the supply side, not the demand side. And that's what we're seeing uh, mm -hmm. because of what we talked about, supply chain, energy cost. The Fed can't drill for oil. You know, raising interest rates doesn't get you more oil or natural gas. So the Fed can't do anything about it except kill the economy. Yeah, and that'll cool it off. But when you pay, uh, you know, I, I put gas in my car and I don't just read about this stuff. You know, it used to be $45. Now it's about $75. Multiply that by 200 million cars uh, across America. What happens is it reduces your discretionary income. If you're paying another 30 bucks at the pump twice a week, then you're not going to go out to dinner Friday night. You're not going to, you know, take a, a vacation, whatever it may be. So that depresses all those other areas. So there is this recursive function. So don't rule out deflation down the road. Not right away, but, you know, maybe next year. So cash, but here's the, here's the biggest value of cash. It gives you optionality, and people don't understand this. Yeah. Uh, what if I said to you, "Hey, I'll sell you, I'll sell you a call option, and at the mar at the market call option on every asset class in the world?" Goes, yeah, that sounds kind of valuable, you know. Well, that's what cash is. You, you know, when things are crashing, you're the one who can go shopping, and nobody's better at this than Warren Buffett. He's got his cash level at Berkshire Hathaway is at an all time high. So there's a place for that. You can have some stocks, but I would look at the energy sector. I mean, this. Um, I actually built and I own the largest non-commercial solar module field in New England. And I run my house off it. It's, it produces about 7.5 um, kilowatt hours. Uh, so I know a little bit about it. And uh, what I know is it doesn't work at night. It doesn't work in snow. It doesn't work in rain. It doesn't work in really cloudy days. By the way, you don't run your house off of solar modules. You run your house off of batteries. 
Yeah. And then mm. the modules charge the battery. So you watch the battery level. That's how you manage it. So it works fine. But if you think you can run cities with that, forget it. So it's just not practical uh, at that scale, even if you thought it was. And it isn't. That's that's very clear. But here comes, uh, you know, wind turbines and um, solar. And I'm not against it. Like you say, I own one. But uh, but they're not scalable. They're intermittent. You can, and they don't give you the base power, uh, the baseline power you need to run a modern power grid. Meanwhile, here's global demand. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the gap, the gap's getting bigger. It's not getting smaller. Renewables, whatever the pros and cons, are not closing the gap. The gap's getting bigger. There is no substitute for oil and natural gas uh, and uranium. You got to, you got to put uranium in the mix and you know, hydro. If you live in Quebec, that's great. A lot of hydro, but it, not so much in the desert. And I've spoken to, you know, without mentioning names, I would say you can go no higher in terms of who knows, you know, let's just say board members of the, five biggest oil companies in the world who, who said, yeah, <laughs> as he said, we talk about that, but we, we can't say it publicly because we'll be, you know, uh, dragged, you know, chained and dragged to the, to, through the streets. But that's just, those are just the facts. So therefore, if you have an oil sector that's been bashed by the climate alarmists and, but you can't do without it, which is true, buy some oil companies, you know, when, when they're, you know, so there's your stock portfolio, private equity, venture, real estate, uh, not commercial, but residential. Yes. And, you know, farmland, that's one of the hottest asset categories, and uh, and gold. So that's diversification, and that's the kind of portfolio you want, the kind of season to taste. So the question is, will the Fed go down that path, do what they have to do, do the only thing they can do uh, to subdue inflation at the cost of a very severe recession and something like a stock market crash, or... Will they see that coming? They'll be the last to know. We'll, we'll all see it <laughs> before they do, but uh, they'll, they'll be the last to know. It's because they rely on flood, flood models and they're kind of in their own economic forecasting bubble and they're very defective ways of thinking about the economy and they're very much a creature of inertia. There are a whole lot of reasons why the Fed is not nimble. It's kind of quite the opposite, but they'll see it eventually, probably when it's too late. And will they balk at that point and stop rate hikes and maybe even reduce rates that could save us from the recession, but that will just amplify the inflation. So mm -hmm. rather than say which one's going to happen, I, I prefer to lay out those two paths and then just watch it very carefully. But more to the point, we've seen this movie before. This is a replay, and I, I think it's on, um, you, know, d you know, like you hit the remote control for double or triple speed. It's going to happen faster. But this is a replay of everything that happened from 2013 to 2019 and, and into 2020. Which was, so I'll just go through it quickly. So 2013, May, Bernanke says we're going to taper asset purchases. That's that's money printing, quantitative easing, whatever you want to call it. The market, you know, tanks, bonds go down. Everyone's like, oh, it's over. Bernanke blocked. But finally, in November 2013, they said, okay, the taper begins. They were still printing money, but at a slower rate, and that matters. That went on until late 2014. The taper was over. They stopped buying new assets. They said, okay, here come the interest rate hikes. Except they didn't come for another year. It wasn't until December 2015 that then Janet Yellen finally raised rates. And then another year for the second rate increase, it was December 2016. So it was really, really slow. It took two and a half years. But they got to two rate hikes. But then here comes Jay Powell. And then like Cloudwork, boom, 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 25 basis point hikes every meeting. And all the Fed was trying to do was, was to get back to normal. They were trying to get interest rates to maybe two and a quarter, two and a half, get the balance sheet down to, you know, something like 2.5 trillion. They never specified it, but that would have been a reasonable level. So, okay, now interest rates are kind of normal, two and a half. Balance sheet's down around two and a half trillion. We're back to normal. We finally got through the, the global financial crisis of 2008. We kind of, we undid all that stuff. Well, what happened? Um, from October 1st, 2018 to December 24th, 2018, the stock market dropped 20%. That was the, the, the December 24, 2018, we call it the, the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock market went down 3% in one day. But the Fed uh, was tightening into the weakness, as they always do. And the last interest rate hike, it was uh, December 16th or 17th, they, within a day or two, but mid-December 2018, they were still hiking and raising rates. And that was the last straw. And then the market just tanked. And then finally, Jay Powell got that message uh, first week of January 2019, he says, okay, we're, that's it. We're going to be patient. Use the word patient. It's one of these code words. You have to get the code book out and see what it means. But patient means we won't raise rates again without giving you advance warning so you can get out of your carry trades or whatever. Uh, and then he went further and said, huh, looks like we got to cut rates. 
and they did. And then by early 2020, here comes the pandemic. And then they took rates all the way back to zero. And then they started QE, I don't know, six, seven, call what you want. They took the balance sheet to seven and a half trillion dollars after getting it down to three and a half trillion. So look at that whole sequence from 2013 to early 2020, including the pandemic. What happened? They tapered the asset purchases. They raised rates. They sank the stock market. Then they said, okay, no more rate hikes. Then they cut rates and then they started QE. And by by April 2020, where were we? Zero rates back down to zero. And the balance sheet was a seven and a half trillion after getting down to about uh, three, three and a half trillion. So that was a big um, a circle. They ended up back where they started from. But the point being, they failed to normalize. They failed to get rates where they wanted. They failed to get the balance sheet where they wanted. They did sink the stock market. Okay. Now, two years forward, here we are again. What are we doing? They just raised rates at the at the March meeting. They're going to raise them again in May. And that's the easiest forecast I've ever made. 50 basis points, May 4th. Boom. You can, you know, you can count on it. And they're going to announce, uh, and by the way, I don't have a crystal ball. The Fed told us this. I mean, that's the thing about the Fed. They may be wrong, but they're transparently wrong. So they tell you what mistakes they're going to make in advance. So that's the Fed forecasting is actually fairly straightforward because you just have to believe them. Uh, so, uh, so they're going to raise rates again in May, probably 50 basis points. They're going to announce a reduction in the balance sheet, whether they actually start it in May, they probably will a hundred billion a month reduction in asset purchases. So that's QT quantitative tightening. In other words, they're running the same playbook they tried to run or they started to run in 2013, 2014. They failed the last time. Why do they think they're going to be any more successful this time? Why do they think they can get out of this? And the answer is, <coughs> pardon me, the answer is they cannot without a recession. They can normalize rates in the balance sheet and they can stop inflation, but not without causing recession and not without causing a stock market crash. So the big question for the next year is, Will the Fed do that? And they may. Or will they balk again, at which point you might rescue the market, but the inflation is just going to go wild? That's that's the debate. But 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 the thing is about framing it that way, you've got two paths, and we'll, we'll get signals along the way. We won't, we won't be the last to know. The Fed will, but we won't. You'll be able to see this coming.